Well, good morning and happy new year to all of you. I hope you're doing well and uh, excited to have this time of worship with you this morning. There's a verse I want to read. Uh, it's going to sound familiar because it was from the passage we studied last week. But this week, as we had quite a few days of rain, I, I thought back to this verse and I want to read it to us as we start this service. Isaiah 55 verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It will accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And that's the promise as we have seen rain come down for a few days now. Uh, in the same way that that does not return void, neither will his word. So as we sing his word this morning, as we hear his word preached this morning, uh, our prayer is that that word will not return void even this morning, just as he has promised in scripture. And so I'm glad that you're here to participate. In, in the study and the singing of God's Word. And, and don't forget, we have another opportunity on Wednesdays. We're starting back this week on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. as we study God's Word as well, if you can join us then. But let's start this service in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for the gift it is to us, the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, as we sing back to you your word as we read your word as we study your word as we talk about your word this morning father we pray that it will nourish our hearts just as rain nourishes the earth father may your word this morning bring us nourishment bring us strength and father we pray that it will not return void in our lives but that it will change us this morning we pray these things in the name of christ our savior amen morning would you stand to your feet as we prepare to worship together you sing it out with me all the creatures of our God and King let's lift up our voice and sing to him all the creatures of our God and King Your voice and with us sing, oh, praise Him, hallelujah, now burning sun with golden beam, now silver moon with salt to gleam.
and earth will join to say, sing, oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Lift up some praise right now to the one who's worthy of it. Well, as we continue to sing together, we focus on our rock, Jesus Christ, the one in whom alone we stand upon as we sing praise, oh praise him, hallelujah. So you join us and sing this morning. In Christ alone hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are sealed when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith. This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones He came to save body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious Thank you. 
He returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Here in the power of Christ we stand Amen That's good news this morning In Christ alone we stand By the power of His word we know the truth By the covering of His blood We have been gifted righteousness In this new year we can start out Knowing That in the beginning Was the word the word was with God and the word was God that's the first few verses of John where he introduces us to this theme of Jesus being the spoken word the power through which literally all creation is made And it's this figure, this word, this symbol of authority and power that we just celebrated in this previous Christmas season as coming as a babe in all humility and lowliness. Coming in his own words not to be served but to serve and to be a ransom for many that's the Jesus that we celebrate this morning would you sing this next song with us you are the word at the beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without So Jesus, you brought heaven down. You sing it out, my sin was great, but your love. My sin was great, your love was greater. absolutely true that death couldn't hold him the schemes of hell couldn't defeat him man could not keep his power from showing so you sing this with us death couldn't hold him down death could not hold you 
the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory seek to make your name known this morning by attributing, attributing to it adjectives that at best don't even come close to describe your majesty when we say what a beautiful name when we say, what a wonderful name, what a powerful name, these words, they find their definition solely in you. How do we know beauty except through your splendor? How do we know wonder except through having seen the one and only son of Jesus. How do we know power except by having witnessed your sacrifice upon the cross and the power of the Spirit raising you to new life? The very words that we use to describe you only do you justice because they're rooted in your identity. We thank you for who you are and what you've done, for teaching us, for being patient with us, for being present with us. God, thank you for your word. That sometimes this life is challenging and yet in your word are promises of your faithfulness. We know you are steadfast. We can treasure those things up in our hearts. 
So God, would you accept this praise offering that we have just given? Would you bless the reading of your word now? And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. It's meant to be opened, explored, pursued. It's made to be read, reread, applied, and used. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, with wisdom, life changing, to lead us on. It's made for guidance to teach us His ways, showing what's true, right, and worthy of praise. It's meant to be hidden deep in our hearts, daily examined as the morning starts. No greater glimpse of God do we have, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. All right, how many of you love the Bible? Just give me a show of hands, come on. Your love of God's word, amen, praise God. Well, we're gonna talk about the Bible this morning. I hope that's okay. No, we do that every week here at Westside, but um, today we are going to specifically focus on the Bible and what God's word says about itself and really what God's word does in us. What happens when we read God's word? What is going on in our soul, in our mind, in our hearts? When God says to to love him with all our, say it with me, our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. What happens within us? That's what I want to talk about today in a sermon titled Sweeter Than Honey. Or if you're looking inside your bulletin, all you uh, type A folks have looked inside your bulletin and gone, that title doesn't match that title. And you're exactly right. My title changes probably 10 times before I get up here and preach. And so sometimes that happens. But this is Sweeter Than Honey from Psalm 119. So turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm in the Psalter, the longest section of Scripture, the longest chapter of Scripture, if you will, in the entire Bible. There are 176 wonderful verses. It would take me 17 minutes just to read it to you, if I were just to read it. And so I've got to get going quick this morning if I'm going to uh, preach a section from this psalm. I'm not going to preach all 176 verses, don't worry. Uh, but I am going to preach, um, if, if, if you notice, in Psalm 119, you'll notice it's an acrostic. That means like, for us in English, it would be like a poem that has the letter A, and then every uh, eight verses in that section all start with the letter A, and then B, and then it does the same thing down B, and then C, and D. It does this in the Hebrew alphabet. And we're going to be in the Mem section Mem, so you can think of that as like the Hebrew M, if you will. And we're going we're, we're gonna to be in Psalm 119, but we're going to start in verse 97. 97. And I, I have a feeling that uh, this, this might not be a section of this psalm that you are as familiar with. And so that's what excites me. Uh, you probably have heard, like the video said, your word's a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. You probably heard that. You probably heard in verse 11, uh, I've hidden your word inside my heart that I might not sin against you. We memorize those verses as kids, right? Kids, you guys know those verses. Uh, your word's a lamp to my feet, light to my path, right? And so, like I said, longest psalm, most likely compiled over a period of time. Some people think David wrote it. Other people think it's a post-exilic writing, so it could have been Nehemiah, Ezra. We really don't know. The author is unknown. But the most important author that we know of all scripture is the Holy Spirit. And so let's dive right in and let's ask this key question this morning. Write, write this down if you're taking notes. This is the key question. It's what we really want to get after. What does it look like to treasure God's word? Just write that question down. What does it look like to treasure God's word? When we treasure his word above all things, when his words and revelation, our our treasure. And so we're gonna answer that question in four ways this morning. Four things happen inside of us. And so let's dive right in. Let's, Let's just get right to it. Let's throw number one up on the screen. The first thing that happens when we treasure God's word is this. We cultivate, everybody say cultivate. We cultivate, yeah, that's so funny with the mask on. It's like, you know, it doesn't sound like cultivate at all, but that's okay. I, I really appreciate you uh, participating. Uh, we cultivate a passionate love for the word through meditation. 
We're going to leave that up there for a second because I know that's kind of a mouthful. I'll read it again. We cultivate a passionate love for the word through meditation. This is found in the first couple of verses of Psalm 119, uh, this mem section. And so go, go with me to verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it when? All day long. Day and night, night and day, right? It reminds us of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of wisdom, right? He walks in the counsel of God. He meditates on the law when? Day and night, night and day. And so I love your law. Hey, pay attention to that exclamation point. It's in there for a reason because this psalmist, whoever wrote this psalm, is passionate about the word of God. And it's why it's my favorite psalm because I'm telling you guys, nothing has changed my life. As I've walked with Jesus for the past 12 years, I got saved at 20, uh, right, right before my 20th birthday, actually at 19. And God's word changed my life. And when I came to faith, I remember going to Lifeway and being totally lost. I'd never owned a Bible my entire life. I'd never read the Bible. I wasn't encouraged to do that. I, I grew up in a religious home, uh, but it, it wasn't really expected of me to read scripture. I had lots of prayers memorized. I had lots of um, you know, good Sunday school answers to general questions and creeds memorized even, like the Nicene Creed. I had that whole thing memorized, but I had never cracked open the Bible. And I went, I was intimidated because there's like 15 translations and this study Bible and that thing. And I was, I was just overwhelmed. I spent $95 of my hard earned college money. Now, 95 bucks is a lot when you're in college, right? Hey, that's, that's a lot of money anyway. But, uh, but $95 at Lifeway for my first study Bible. It was the Life Application Study Bible, the New Living Translation. Had no clue what that meant, but it turned out to be great for me because I'd never read the Bible before. And it's a, it's a little bit looser translation, easier to read. And so I made my way through the entire Bible. Uh, not, not on a reading plan, just slow. It took me a few years, but uh, just, just began to consume God's Word. And as I ate God's word, as I digested God's word, as I was nourished by the word of God, my life was completely transformed. And I've never been the same since. And I've never fallen out of love with God's word. And I, I, I want that for you. I really do. And I know many of you in the room feel the same way. Like you're totally empathizing with me right now. You're like, yes, I love the law. But maybe there's some of us here today, if we're really honest, we're like, man, I, I mean, I love the law. But my relationship with God and his word has grown a little cold. It's become more about maybe uh, the, rigor, the, the rigorous devotion life or maybe just you know, that day by day, hey, I've checked it off my box. I've done my quiet time. But there's not this passionate love that's being cultivated anymore. And hey, that happens in any relationship, doesn't it? Right, over time, marriage, right? Those of you that have been married longer than 10 minutes know this. Um, I'm coming up on my uh, 10th year. Some of you are coming up on your 20th or 30th or 40th. But Get this, it takes work, doesn't it? Relationships take work. And it's not just about a relationship with the Bible, it's about a relationship with who? With God, exactly. And so we cultivate this passionate love. So the first attitude we we see towards the Bible in this psalm is the attitude of love. But how do we fall in love with God's word? Again, the word cultivation. Think of farming, it takes work. Parenthood, it takes work. Marriage, it takes work work. And this verse tells us, look, look back at verse 97 at the very, at the very end here and end, into verse 98. I meditate on it all day long. So how does cultivation happen? Through meditation. Now hold on, meditation. Now what does that mean? Because today, if you Google meditation, I did, and you can you have permission to take your phone out right now and Google meditation and just click images and, and just look at that, you're not going to find anything Christian. You're going to find lots of Buddhism, lots of yoga, lots of uh, sitting still, lots of crisscross applesauce Indian style. You're going to see lots of yoga mats. You're going to see breathing and stretching and mindfulness and things like that. That's not what we're talking about here. Biblical Christian meditation simply means this. I think of a crock pot every time. How many, how many of you have a crock pot or, or an Instapot now because we're in 2021 and we, could, we, we couldn't wait on the crock pot anymore so we got to do the Instapot. We, we have one too. I love the crock pot 
because you put stuff in there and then you let it go. I mean, it was, it was great when we first got married. Even when I was in college, I used a crock pot in my dorm. I wasn't really supposed to, but I, I plugged it up in, in my dorm and I'd put all the food in there and I'd go to class and I'd come back later and I'd have, you know, stew beef ready to go. And that's what it does. It simmers, it sits, it takes its time. And what we try to do in the church is we try to take God's word and we try to get, get in our quiet time and we want to zap fry God's truth straight into our life. We go, God, I got 10 seconds. I got to run out the door. I'm late. I got to grab my coffee and, you know, do all this other stuff. And, and I'm, you know, I'm running late for this doctor's appointment or this particular thing. I forgot about this. And our lives are kind of frenzied sometimes. And we get in that hurry and we try to microwave what God's truth is in our lives. But what he wants us to do is embrace the crock pot method. And that's called meditation. Now, when do we meditate? All the day long. And so this is not just a time where we sit still. It is. We can sit still. We can close our eyes. We can, we can read a passage of God's word like what we're reading today. And we can close our eyes and try to recall the words. Or we can have our Bible in front of us and really think deeply about what we're reading. That's the other thing I want you to know about meditation is that it's, it's not just Bible reading. It's not just reading what the commentary says that it means. It's not just listening to a sermon on something, but it's really sitting still long enough to marinate in God's truth and to slow cook. Let, let that slow cook into your soul. And that's how God wants to speak to you often times like he does to me. He wants to, he wants to do the slow cook method. So cultivation happens through meditation. It's a lost spiritual discipline that will change your life. Maybe your 2021 goal this year is to revive the meditation. I think about a hot tub, right? When you go and get in the hot tub, it's, it's, my, it's my little boy's favorite part of the beach trip, when we finally get to get in the hot tub. And so we go to the hot tub at night after we've been at the beach all day, and you know, we shower up, and then we go get in the hot tub. And we get in. Now, how silly would it be if we sat down in the hot tub and then, you know, let's just pretend we're get, getting in right here and we're in the hot tub. We go, oh, well, that's it. All right, cool. That was hot. It was very good. That would be ridiculous, right? No, you sit in the hot tub for minutes at a time and you relax and you take deep breaths and you just, you know, unless you have young kids like me and it's just pandemonium, the kids are splashing everywhere. There's gummy worms in there somehow and, you know, you've got a poopy swimming diaper and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, but most of you uh, probably uh, could just sit in there and relax, and this is what meditation looks like sometimes, but sometimes it looks like as we're going, everybody say, as you go. As you go through, throughout the day, as you go throughout your daily routine, God calls to mind what we read, doesn't he? How often does he bring to mind these truths in our mind? And how often when we have something in our devotion time, does he give us an opportunity to apply it that very day? He does that, doesn't he? Because he's a good God, because he loves you, because he wants you to grow in his word. And so, cultivation happens through meditation. This is a Spurgeon quote I just wanted to read to you guys. We do so many Charles Spurgeon quotes here. He's a great pastor in the 19th century over in London, England, London Baptist. And here we go. Spurgeon says this, I beseech you to let your Bibles be everything to you. Carry this matchless treasure with you continually and read it and read it and read it again and again. Turn to its pages day and by night. Let its narratives mingle with your dreams. Let its precepts color your lives. Let its promises cheer you darkness. Let its divine illumination make glad your life. And as you love God, love this book, which is the book of God. And the God of books, as it has rightly been called. So the second thing that happens to us when we treasure God's word, the second thing is this. Write this down this morning. We gain wisdom. We gain wisdom to apply God's word in all circumstances. Let's read the next few verses here together. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. So you're gonna see in Psalm 118, if you read from beginning to end, you're gonna see words like precepts, commands, your word. Um, you're, you're gonna see your testimonies, uh, all, all these different synonyms for the Bible, essentially, for what God has revealed. And so whenever you see those buzzwords, just remember, they're talking about the same thing. 
And what does he say here? He says that not only do we fall in love with the word of God, but God wants to give us wisdom, not just so we're, we're smarter as we think of being smart, just being a know-it-all, just intellectual fortitude, but no, wisdom comes through understanding, right? Solomon begged for that. Solomon could have asked for anything in the Bible. God said, hey, you name it, and you had it. And he asked for what? Wisdom and understanding. That's right. And that's what God wants to give us. Your commands are always with me, he says. It reminds me of a push notifications on, on this, right? Those of you that have smartphones, the push notifications come. You get the dings like I did. I thought my phone was on silent and, uh, and it wasn't. And it did that at a wedding yesterday too. It was really embarrassing. But anyway, the push notifications come and they drop down. There's little banner that says, hey, you've got a goal to meet today. Or hey, here's a reminder. Or hey, you've got another email or this or that. We have these push notifications and the Holy Spirit does that to us as well. Through his word, he will push those, those, those Holy Spirit notifications straight to your soul. If we'll give him the chance, if we'll ask him, if we'll meditate long enough to where we can simmer in the truth and let those notifications come. Now what the psalmist isn't doing here, he's not going on a prideful rant about how he's just smarter than his enemies, his teachers and his elders. He's not puffed up with pride. But what he's saying is that there's no substitution for meditation and obedience to the precepts of God. There's no substitution for thinking critically and deeply and longly and as you go, Lee. <laughs> That's not a phrase, but it just was. There's no substitute for meditation and obedience. You can know all the things you want to know. You can have every answer to Bible categories that there is and you know, know all, this, all, the, all those things. And those things are great. It's great to know things. But where did the Pharisees get it wrong? Do you, do you remember the Pharisees in the Gospels? They knew the law. They had memorized the Torah. They memorized large sections of the Old Testament that we find it difficult to even read. I mean, they had Leviticus memorized. And Jesus shows up and says, you guys have missed it because you value the sacrifice and the religious things more than obedience. And you placed a burden upon people where you've minimized obedience and you've maximized the religious expression so that you can look better. What Jesus does is he flips it. He says, no, obedience is the most important thing. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll obey me. Obedience, there's no substitute for meditation and obedience to the precepts of God. He's drawn the distinction between one group knowing something with their head and with their life experience and sometimes even claiming wisdom from a source other than God's word, hyper-pragmatism, uh, this just works, trust me. And there's some of that out there. All, all truth is really God's truth. I mean, you know, God's the author of truth. He is truth, he embodies truth. But there are some other sources of truth that don't really give us what they sell us. It's not really truth. And they think that just because they have their life experience, their stuff in their head, and then comparing that with what it's like to treasure something in your heart and to actually obey the truth, and as the psalm says, to keep it. I obey your precepts. Your translations may say, I keep your precepts. That keep word doesn't mean I just store it up in my, in my holy uh, locker, in my heart. But no, it means that I I keep it enough to actually do what you tell me to do. And a long time ago, a pastor just told me this when I was early in my relationship with the Lord. He just said, look, read the Bible and do what it says and it will go well for you. And that just always stuck with me. I know that sounds so, uh, you know, just kind of like a, a duh thing, but it's really not. I mean, when it comes down to it, we read the Bible, we do what it says. We do what he says, right? Because God wants to grow us. And so let's talk more about obedience and our third result of treasuring God's word. The third thing that happens, not only do we cultivate a passionate love, not only do we gain wisdom in all circumstances, we also think critically about the faithful obedience in our discipleship. Again, there's that word think critically, to meditate. It's, it's coming with us through the whole psalm and it shows back up here and there. Look at verse 101. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I've not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. There's a quote by F.W. Robertson. It says, obedience is the organ of spiritual knowledge. I'll read that again. Obedience is the organ, like in your body, like, like an organ 
of spiritual knowledge. And so again, there's no substitute for obedience. And as we look at the verse, um, we're reminded that instead of living a guilt trip kind of journey with God, where I'm going to do my best so that I don't feel guilty when I fail, the psalmist says, no, 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 I'm gonna think critically about every potential path that I could travel down, right? Every potential option for this situation. So pick a situation in your life. Think about every possible path that you could do. And he says, I'm going to eliminate the possibility of choosing a path that would lead me to evil. And this is wisdom, isn't it? This is where people fail in morality all the time because they fail to do what they don't have to do. They don't set the boundaries where they think they need to set them and eliminate those possibilities for evil, right? There's some boundaries in my life that God has led me to, some things that I, some, some certain boundaries in my life that I embrace, where I don't do this, and I only do this at this time, and I have those things in place because of a scripture like this that says, I've kept my feet from every evil path, and that means we've got to think about our choices and eliminate the possibility of being fleshy in those moments, right? Because it's, it's just too easy, isn't it? No divorce that I know of in, in, in recent past or any pastor's ever told me about, no, no divorce has just come from just this one-time thing that just poof, explodes right there. No, it was a slow and steady compromise over years and years and years of deterioration and morality. A person that did not keep their feet from every evil path. You look at addiction, it's the same thing. Slow and steady and faithful deposits of immorality in someone's life get someone to this addicted point, right? It doesn't just happen in one day. It happens slowly over time. And if we'll keep our feet from every evil path, this doesn't mean we're perfect, guys, right? We're not claiming perfection. This is not the psalmist saying, hey, guys, I, I, I have, I mean, like literally avoided every evil path. I've never traveled down one. No, 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 he's saying that, he's saying this is my mindset. This is my meditation that I'm going to cut off those possibilities and I'm going to go, I'm gonna be a little drastic and here's how we deal with sin, church. We deal with sin, not casually, but drastically. If you want success over a certain sin in your life that's just continuing to, to be just a huge battle for you, then deal with it drastically. How does war happen? Casually? No, drastically. There's, str- there's strategy there's heavy investment, there's sacrifice. All of those things are required. And what we see here is really the fruit of self-control. I, I, I've restrained myself from what I could do. First Corinthians 6 puts it like this, one of my favorite verses, all things are lawful but not beneficial. So I could do that in my Christian liberty, I could do X, Y, and Z, but I don't. Because I know my family's history and I know every man that, come, that, that has come before me has been a drunkard and has been addicted to substance. And so there are certain things I don't do in my life because I don't wanna ever go down that evil path. I don't wanna ever get there. I just don't even allow myself the possibility of that. And that's for me. And I want you to think about what that might be for you. What are are those paths of elimination that God might lead you to today so that you might obey God's word? Discipleship has been described as directional. Remember that, discipleship is directional. It's not a destination. We're not, woo, we're at discipleship. All right, I'm here. No, it's directional. We head a certain way and we keep walking. Walk in the light, God's word says, amen? It says walk in the light. We're constantly moving in the direction that God's word is compelling us to pursue. I have not departed from your laws, verse 102. I have not departed for you yourself had taught me. Again, we will not achieve perfection in this life as it pertains to obedience in our discipleship, but we can aim for it. Be holy as I am holy, right? A professional athlete doesn't aim any less to hit a baseball. Michael Jordan did not aim any less to drain every shot from three-point land just because of the possibility of missing 60% of the time. No, they aim for perfection every time. And if we do it in professional sports, shouldn't we do it in our faith? We aim for perfection every time. We don't go, well, well, nobody's perfect. I guess I'll just do the best I can. And typically when we say that, it's really ironic. Typically when I find myself saying that, I'm not really doing the best I can. It's actually an excuse. I'll speak for me. But I have a feeling that some of you in the room could identify with me today. 
No, it's, it's I'm going to do everything that I know how to do to obey this word and be laser focused on it. And yes, I'm gonna fail, but I'm not gonna try any less and I'm gonna trust God with the results, amen? Because he's in charge of our sanctification. We aim high because we love the law. It's our meditation. And God is teaching us everything needed for our good and his glory, Romans 8, right? Our good and his glory. Here's the last thing, and then we'll be done. The last thing that happens when we treasure God's word is that we experience a shift in appetite as we grow in Christ. A shift in appetite. Let's read these last two verses together. How sweet are your words to my taste. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. There's two shifts as we close today. A shift from physical to spiritual satisfaction. Here's what he says. Physical satisfaction is fantastic. None of us would disagree with that because here's what happens. I go to Village Grill in Abbeville when they're open during COVID and I get that cashew pie, that cashew butter. Come on, guys. Anybody? Anybody get that butter cashew pie? Yes, amen. The only hand raised I've seen this morning. Awesome. So uh, the cashew butter pie, right? Or maybe it's the other way. Anyway, it's the best. It's so sweet. You get that thing, it's, it's just whipped and nice and it gets to the table and you just, every single bite is so sweet. Oh, I love dessert way too much. Oh man. Yes, sir, absolutely. It physically satisfies, but here's the deal. In a matter of minutes, what happens? Fading of satisfaction that takes place, it's gone. The sugar high, the crash, right? Right? The Bible moves us beyond mere physical pleasures in life that bring satisfaction for a moment to a spiritual satisfaction that is enduring. As we meditate on the word and as we look constantly for opportunities to apply and obey what we've received from the Lord. And here's the second shift, a shift from tolerating sin to hating sin. The psalmist ends here with, now that I have understanding, I relate differently to sin in my life. He says earlier, I I have not departed from your law, O Lord, but he does say, I have departed from sin. Not that he is sinless, but he does not seek sin. His direction is different, right? Discipleship's directional. He's headed this way. I'm not headed that way. And as I head this way, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be shot at, I'm gonna be cursed, I'm I'm going to be, I'm going to receive all kinds of, of enemy fire. Ephesians 6 promises, right? Where we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces that want to see you fail, that want to see you renounce your faith, that want to see you, honestly, more than that, probably just become sterile. The sterile Christian that sits in the pew every week and is just numb to the truth. And it doesn't jack you up anymore. It doesn't light your fire anymore. There's no cultivated passion anymore. I pray to God, if that's you today, that your passion would be reunited. And as, as uh, Paul writes in Timothy, that that gift given to you would, would be kindled afresh. But the shift from tolerating sin to hating sin works like this in my life. Uh, I, I brought with me today, as, as we close, my favorite childhood snack. Favorite childhood snack. I used to sit down and watch Power Rangers when it first came out in 1993. And, I, and I'd sit down in front of the TV. I'd watch, I'd watch uh, Power Rangers and Bobby's World. Does anybody remember Bobby's World? And I would sit down with this sandwich right here. And do, do, you, do you know what this is? Do, do we have any guesses? Oh, I, I wish it was because I'm about to take a bite. It's a ketchup sandwich. And, and so you know I'm not lying. It's a ketchup sandwich. And I would take this ketchup sandwich... Mm. Just like bringing back memories. Power Rangers, Bobby's World, no responsibilities. It was great. Oh, that was tough. How many of you are getting a little nauseous right now? Anybody? Ketchup sandwich. This is not really your breakfast food of choice. I loved ketchup sandwiches. Now, I hate ketchup sandwiches. It's disgusting. 
as I ate that. I was just like, why did I used to eat this? You know what God's word does? It shifts us from our ketchup sandwiches and moves us beyond to something greater. I don't eat ketchup sandwiches anymore. All God's people said, amen. Yeah, no, I, I don't eat them anymore. And there are certain things in your life what used to bring you happiness and fulfillment will begin to disgust you. What are those things right now that are the things that you tolerate that you know in your heart that you need to really hate, right? Maybe it's that genre of movie that if you're just honest, you just, you, you just love that style of movie, but if you're really honest, you'd, you'd feel awkward watching it with said person or this person but you know that it's really not as glorifying to God as you hope it will be. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's just something that you're tolerating right now, but that you need to move into a state of disgust. There's a process called sanctification where we become more and more like Jesus each day. Romans 8 says that God's plan is that we're conformed into the image of Jesus. And though Christ delivers us from the power of sin and sin's eternal effects, there's still an appetite issue. Our appetite for sin doesn't go away immediately after we choose to follow Christ. It's a process of sanctification that takes a lifetime, right? And each of us have a unique journey in our discipleship as God shifts our appetite from what used to fill us up, from what used to be so great, and now by God's grace would allow a righteous disregard to well up within us. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ delivers us from the power of sin and the curse of the wages of sin, which is death. Jesus in turn dies for us so that we can be brought to life. Saved from sin makes us a new creation, 2 Corinthians says. And I hope and pray you've experienced this kind of transformation in your heart. If not, you can call out to Jesus today for your salvation. You can pray to him right now where you are today. Admit to him you're a sinner. Tell him with your own words that you believe in him as Lord, the king of your life, and a savior, the God in whom you trust, who died and rose again for you so that you could be forgiven and made right with God. For every past, present, and future sin, Christ died for you and offers his forgiveness and mercy. Accept him today. If you're online, we issue you the same invitation right, right where you are. You can accept Christ today. And if you're placing your faith and hope and trust in Jesus today, let us know. There's a, there's a little card right in front of you that you can fill out. And you can say, hey, I'm, I made a decision today or I'm ready to make that decision. Or I wanna talk to a pastor about making that decision to follow Jesus. If you're online, the same thing. Drop us a comment and uh, shoot us an email and let us, l- let us know how we can help you take that next step. Hey church, do you treasure God's word? Maybe your response today is to take a next step with the Bible. Maybe to get a Bible or a new Bible or begin a new reading plan or get a new commentary that will guide you on your journey as you walk with the Lord and get understanding and insight and wisdom. My prayer for you is genuinely this, that in 2021, that more than ever, God's word will be treasured by you, that it will be sweeter than honey on your lips. That's my prayer for you, church. I wanna pray for us. Dear Jesus, we love you so much. You are our treasure. Again, we love God's word so much. We love your word so much, not because of the ink and pages themselves, but because of the author of those pages, the author of life, the author and finisher of our faith. And so God, help each person in here fall in love with your word and to cultivate a deep and unfading passion to not only know your word, but to meditate upon your word, to obey your word, and to grow in your unfading, imperishable word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as we have this time of closing, would you stand as we sing our invitation hymn together, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou 
bidst me come to Thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. We sing your praises and we give you 